It's very fitting to have Paul here as the very first guest of our spring series to celebrate the 180th anniversary of the founding of this university. At the Writers Institute, we're proud to have played a small role, a tiny, tiny role in Paul Harding's success and achievement. We collaborate with Skidmore College on a summer workshop, the New York State Summer Writers Institute. Harding enrolled in that workshop a number of years ago. At the time, he was the drummer in a rock band that had just broken up. By his own description, he had no sense at all of what he would do with his life, no clear plan for the future. Look at him now. Please welcome Paul Harding. Thank you, Mark. Am I on? Is this thing on? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for coming out, too. It's great to see everybody. It's, it's great to have a, a, yet another conversation with you. Um, so I, I promised uh, the folks um, who, because the, our, our afternoon sessions are open to the general public as well as to students, and we have classes that partner with us, um, I promised folks at the afternoon sessions that I wouldn't repeat my questions. So I'm uh, going to keep to that promise, but you guys, when you get the mic, will be free to ask anything you like. So, um, so if there's anything that I don't ask about that you're really interested in, please uh, have your questions ready. Um, so, uh, this other Eden, um, there's a sense that Apple Island is a kind of paradise on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's, it's a hellscape. Um, it's a place of starvation and perfectly cruel New England weather. People subsist on a diet of smoke and salt air and herbal tea, and families huddle together for warmth for most of the long, dark winter. How can it be both a paradise and a hell? Oh, I don't know. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, well, there's a little bit of irony in the title. Um, I think it's the, you know, the, the context I was thinking of, just even invoking Eden is, um, you know, first of all, it's, the, it's a line from Shakespeare's play, Richard II, in which the character, as you all know, right, John of Gaunt, um, is sort of lamenting what looks like the bad fate of England, and he says, the scepter dial, the seat of kings, whatever it is, you know, this other Eden. Um, and so it's a sort of very localized sense of Eden, which is just, um, you know, a hard one and a hard maintained community that these people had that they you know that they had sustained together for over a century um, and um, and just you know f hard fought freedom to just live their lives as individuals as a family as you know neighbors as fellows that sort of thing um, and so from and we can get into this as we go, you know, but from within the community looking out, it's, you know, it's as, it's, uh, the people are as loyal to it and in love with it and exasperated by it and it's provoked by it as anybody is um, who has a sense of home, a sense of family, a sense of community. Um, and so just that idea that um, it can be, it can be sort of heaven and hell at the same time, you know, um, so it's, 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 it's you know, so much of the book is about your begats and about your origins and where you come from and how indelible um, that sense of place and of belonging is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is there any sense, um, you know, it, it would be hard, I mean, th there's something very beautiful about this community and yet it would be hard to describe it as a utopian community, but at this, is there any sense that it is in some way you know, a, a model for an alternative America where race doesn't matter at all. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's not, I didn't, I don't think of it as being a model, just partly because of the way I think of how novels are and the way, you know, the, this, this community in particular was not, a, a, it did not arise out of an act of social engineering, as it were. It was sort of an improvised community that just ended up being the way it was. And America being the way it is, was, is, continues to be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, integrated communities tend not to suffer 
very um, good fates in this country still even now. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, I didn't have a thesis about it. You know, I just sort of, you know, just partly became interested in that aspect of the novel just out of, you know, the, the curiosity of kind of what happens to um, racially, particularly racially integrated communities. Um, and so there's nothing utopian about it. I mean, I think of it as sort of a, once when you're on the island in the book, if you take a look at the book when you're in the island, it's the people just look at their, themselves and their families and their community the way that anybody does. You're just trying to make your way, day, you know, work, make a living, take care of your children, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and then once you get outside it, you start to get much more pejorative, dehumanizing, you know, um, oppressive kind of attitudes. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I, when I was writing it, I was thinking of it as, you know, it's a, it's a tender-hearted novel set in a hard-hearted world, as it were. Yeah. Um, I, I had actually planned to have a better segue to ask you to read um, this very beautiful passage, um, uh, the farewell banquet to uh, the artist um, Ethan Honey. and. Uh, and I, honestly, I've forgotten what my setup was. But but if you if you if, if, I'll give you a setup, <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got plenty of them. If, 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 if you if you could set it up for us, that would be delightful. It's it's such a it's such a wonderful passage. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, the way that the way that we, we, it, we, I can watch this, I can do a segue. Boy, oh boy. No, um, because. Because, you know, realizing that you'd be writing, a st that I'd be writing about, uh, you know, a community that did suffer such privation, one of the things that you want to do for your characters because you love them is you give them a big banquet. You, you know, so you, you wanted to write just very, very simply started off with the, uh, the spirit of counterpoint, just since so much of of what they suffer materially, anyways, is a kind of impoverishment. I wanted to give them a kind of prosperity and a superabundance, and so this is just a very, this is a very brief passage in which um, they have the kind of plenitude that you know it's, it's almost heavenly to them. It's almost, it's almost unworldly um, to them. So this is just, this is just the you know all the, this community coming together to give a um, kind of a send-off dinner for this young kid who's going away. The Islanders prepared a send-off banquet for Ethan three days before he left for Massachusetts. That morning, Iris and Violet McDermott took their pay for the week and went to the mainland and bought cream and milk from a bachelor farmer whose laundry they did, and instead of heating water for washing, they rinsed their metal tub out and started a vat of chowder with a cod, Candace Lark caught, and a bucket of clams from Eha. Esther gave the girls directions to the far back corner of a field who certainly, by now long dead farmer, had decades earlier stopped harvesting each year so that she and her mother and the other women could have some corn or potatoes for the island and whose subsequent owner had continued to leave untouched for the gleaners without a word or interruption. Tabitha and Charlotte returned with, a, with sacks of corn and they spent the afternoon shucking the ears and picking the silk from the rows of niblets. Annie Parker snuck off to the main, the mainland, with rabbit lark and they picked strawberries and raspberries and blackberries and rabbit found nearly a handkerchief full of truffles. Eth Eha gathered oysters from their beds and lobsters from his traps, and how, how no one ever knew a dozen brown bottles of ale brewed in Portland. Matthew Diamond asked for and received loaves of fresh bread from a baker in town and a block of new butter from a dairy. Theophilus Lark went, around, went about the island and borrowed every cup and plate and cleaned them all with his rag. He found two old doors and laid them end to end on sawhorses in the meadow to make a trestle table and brought four benches from the schoolhouse. Eha prepared a fire downwind near the tables and set a huge ancient metal pot of water on it. At seven o'clock, the islanders congregated at the tables. Matthew Diamond made a brief speech congratulating Ethan on his talent and encouraging him in his upcoming journey, which was no doubt frightening, but also a blessing. Eha Honey presented Ethan with the rigging knife he'd inherited from Esther, who'd inherited it from her mother, who'd inherited it from her father, and so on, all the way back to Benjamin Honey, the, the founder of the, of the community, 
who'd carved the outline of Africa and the Leviathans and mermaids into the whalebone handle himself. Everyone cried three cheers for our Ethan. Then Mr. Diamond said a brief Thanksgiving prayer for the meal and for everyone on the island. Everyone said, Amen, and Eha dumped all the wriggling lobsters into the boiling water. The islanders feasted on lobsters, the tenderest they'd ever had, they all agreed, drenched in the melted fresh butter, bowls and bowls of the chowder, the creamiest and richest they'd ever had, they all said, fresh bread with the crustiest crust and softest insides anyone had ever eaten, broken in chunks from the loaves, slathered too in the fresh butter, oysters, the coldest and briniest and most succulent ever, everyone shouted in between, sucking them from their shells, corn that everyone agreed was the sweetest they'd ever tasted as they munched their way along and around ear after buttered ear. The darkest, muskiest, most mysterious and beguiling truffles ever to have sprouted and the sweetest, plumpest, freshest berries anyone had ever tasted, they said, popping one after another down or cramming handfuls at a time into their mouths as the children and Annie Parker did. And beer, glorious, they all said, rich, dark, creamy, fortifying. Everyone had a small glass or two, including the children and Mr. Diamond. Even Rabbit Lark sipped some from a teacup painted with roses. The dogs galloped around the table, laughing and catching all the scraps the islanders threw at them in their mouths. The women sang their songs, and Eha and Zachary, hand to God, growled some old sea shanties, and Matthew Diamond sang a lovely hymn in a clear, beautiful voice. Ethan was so overwhelmed and abashed that he wept even as he spooned more chowder into his mouth and cracked another lobster claw and sang along with the women's desolate, joyous songs. The islanders were so used to diets of wind and fog, to meals of slow-roasted sunshine and poached storm clouds, so used to devouring sautéed shadows and broiled echoes, they found themselves stupefied by such an abundance of food and drink. For that evening, it seemed to them as if they were sending Ethan off on all their behalves. And it seemed as if by sending him off to paint his beautiful pictures, they all might somehow unhouse homelessness, might somehow bankrupt poverty. It seemed to all of them that evening as if they might somehow even starve hunger itself. <laughs> Beach reading, beach reading. <laughs> it's, it's such a, a beautiful uh, feast of, of language. Um, we, we talked in the afternoon about uh, how th this isn't a historical novel, strictly speaking. And uh, you've talked about the limits you put on your own historical research, that you're not trying to recreate the actual historical community that inspired this. But it's so clear from a, a passage like that that you've done deep research uh, into the material culture um, of, of this time. I mean, that all feels entirely authentic. And um, is that a lot of, re are you researching spoons and knives and recipes and, and, and uh, costume and, and? Yeah, in, in that case, no, because I just grew up on the North Shore of Boston. So like, I've been to a bunch of clam bakes put on by <laughs> Woodman's Clam Shack in Ipswich, Massachusetts. Yeah, so I kind of had that repertoire, that, you know, that kind of menu at my fingertips, you know. And, and part of that, too, is just, you know, the joy of trying to write, you know, just a really beautiful, kind of sensuous, again, kind of abundant passage and give it to your characters. Um, but also, I mean, everything is you know, sort of multivalent, multilayered. One of the things that I appreciate most when I see it well done is writing about food. And, you know, because, you know, you have so much of civilization occurs at table, you know, when people break bread, you know, so it's holy and it's elaborate. And um, so, you know, when I was thinking of that, I was even just thinking of some of the, one of my favorite writers of, or depictors of meals is um, Thomas Mann. Writes just in, you know these big families you know gathering around these 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 um, these meals that that are described you know far beyond the practical 
<laughs> you know, the, the, the practical um, 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 use that they have in the in, in, in the in the passages in which they appear. So just thinking about that super saturation, you know, of and, and super abundance. Anyways, you know, yeah. You know, so much of writing is just saying, you know, I really loved that when I saw that in, you know, Virginia Woolf or in whatever, wherever, and just say, I think I'm going to try to write a scene like that. You know, if, make yourself sensitive to moments and opportunities when you think, oh, there's an opportunity where I can try to write something um, in the in the tradition of uh, another writer. Um, um, who I admire. You seem uh, so Im immersed in other art forms. You're, you're, you were a rock drummer, um, and, and you're writing. I am a rock drummer. And, uh, you, yeah, no, he actually he, he boasted that he's a better rock drummer now than when he was in a rock band that toured Europe. So the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Right. So um, you, you're, you're writing. Uh, seems so interdependent with, with other arts, uh, painting uh, with Ethan Honey, wood carving, Zachary Hantagod Proverbs, uh, home building even with, with Iha, um, music, drumming, poetry. How important is it for writers or artists of any kind uh, to learn or at least appreciate other arts and crafts and even, even trades? I don't, you know, on the one hand, it's absolutely important. On another, it's if you can write a good book and not do it with all sorts of other art, go, knock yourself out. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, I just, I'm just, um, I'm just always, since I, you know, so for ex example, I work with words all the time now, and there are times where, you know, I almost get word blind. I, I, I become, I, I just get past a couple the words start turning inside out and I sort of can't articulate myself ling through language. And so I go to a museum and I look at a bunch of paintings or I go listen to a symphony or a you know, piano sonata or something like that. And it sort of you know, refreshes my brain. And, then when, I, and, and when, I, when I come back to language, it's sort of, um, I've been revivified. I think that's, and, and I don't know, I, I don't know if this is true of, all, you know, I think it's true of enough writers or artists, but it does feel very inspirational. It feels to me very improvisational, like in the case of drumming, like jazz drumming. And I do feel like the kind of, you know, it, I feel like the inspiration, as it were, or the imagination, you know, just it, you know, the universe or some signal comes through, you know, this, this machine or instrument or whatever. And if I'm sitting at the drums, whatever that signal, that inspiration, that imagination is, it precipitates into the world as rhythm and drumming and music. And if I'm sitting at my laptop or with a note, you know, it precipitates into the world as English, as English prose. So I think the, the, the richer and more varied your repertoire of different idioms, uh, mediums, is, you know, that you can, you can I, I just find that I can refresh um, you know, my, my perception and my depth of field and my angles, I can, you know, if I think of it in terms of like, what, is, what if I write this scene as if it's a mural or make the scene as if it's a collage or write the scene as if it is a fugue or something like that. And not, you know, it's a lot of ersatz, like, you know, I don't know anything about painting, I don't know anything about music, you know, in any sort of deep theoretical way, but just always refracting things through those different those different idioms and genres, just to see what you get um, that you might not otherwise get if you're just working with just always the same the, the same idiom. So this is a, a story about a, a community of people with blood from, as you put it, every continent except Antarctica. Um, there are characters with blonde hair and blue eyes and snow white skin uh, with, at the same time, African features. Um, and there are characters with every combination of visible human traits, uh, even one character Iris with two different colored eyes, one brown, one blue. Um, we, we bring in so many writers from so many backgrounds to the Writers Institute, ma many different ethnic and cultural backgrounds. Inevitably, part of the conversation is who has the right to tell whose story? And I'd, like, I'd love to have you address this how, however you like. Um, 
What, what gives you permission? The, the way, there's so many ways. It's so irreducible. You can never make a dead letter out of this because so much of it has to do with how do you, how do you pay respect to and bear witness to the old I and thou, right? Like bearing witness to other people's humanity. How do you do that? And how do you make gestures of fellowship rather than segregation? You know, dignity and you know, um, uh, and respect rather than disrespect and objectification, that sort of thing. And so it can never be a dead letter. It can never be like this or that gives you the right. I think of it as the reader has the right to give me the right or not give me the right. You can, you don't have to read the book. You know, um, talked about it a little bit this afternoon. And, um, um, you know, I ran into, I ran into. Um, it, in, on, in, one, in some ways, perfectly understandably nervous <laughs> editors who didn't end up editing the book, um, per, but you know, who just thought, oh, this will just get, this will just evaporate on entry into the world, right? Um, and and I thought, well, you know, I used to be, but you know, there's the real world, and ha in some ways, it's sort of like if we're not allowed to write about the the prevailing reality of our country, of our communities, of it, you know, then th then it's hopeless. So I just thought, if it's if, if I'm going to err on one side or another, I'm going to err on the side of trying to write about people who are together and you know, make these overtures and gestures of fellowship and dialogue rather than. Segregation basically is what it ended up feeling like because you know I started. I mean, it's just been part of the reason why you're an artist or why you're a writer is to engage in these deepest things, these deepest subjects, these deep, deepest human circumstances, um, um, in a in a way that um, that describes them in their real irreducible complexity. And so I just knew, you know, one false step with the, any of this stuff, people are just going to know it. People are going to know when the second you're just propagandizing or writing bullshit or just kind of trying to um, saw away at one particular, one particular political angle on all of it. Um, but as I was, you know, like the, art is the occasion to grapple with the, with the most, these most, the most complicated and difficult and open subjects. And so I just thought, this is just one book. It's not meant to be the final word. It's not even supposed to be an intermediate. And it's just, you imagine other people will come afterwards and write books. And, you know, so it's just part of, you know, the repertoire of American conversation about itself and about its history and about its legacies and that sort of thing. And that was happening in the context of some, you know, you know conversations in which people who will remain un unnamed, you know, it suggests, well, why don't you just make all the Islanders white. And I thought, talk about erasure, right? You know what I mean? It's, it's just sort of like, it, it, it sort of, it, it turns inside out on itself, you know, the sort of, I said, you, so, you, so am I supposed to write, I'm supposed to turn all the people wh wh white, well, I better make them all heterosexual too, right? Like, and then I'll just be like, they all better play golf, they all better be 56 year old straight white guys, you know? And then it would be like, then it would be an equally deplorable novel for you know because it would be heteronormative what and while I was having these conversations and reporting on them to very, you know many friends colleagues students former and current whatever who were variously black people of color lgbtq trans whatever and they would say you know it's funny because when we have the same conversation when we, we have conversations with um, those some of those same editors they say all you can do is write about your identity and i just want to write a fucking thriller you know what i mean or it's, sorry excuse my french but you know what i mean like and so you start i started thinking that's just segregation you have these people arbitrarily saying you can't imagine one another's lives you can't you can't write your way into other circumstances other than the exact ones that you've lived you know and i just think that's l l contradictory to the spirit of the imagination and art and fellowship and all that sort of stuff um and so it's just a part of it is just you, you have to be, you have to take it seriously and you have to really, it took me 10 years to write the book and a big part of it was just going over every sentence and just saying is this, this can't resort to any kind of prefabricated thinking. It can't resort to anything other than 
what is true for e whatever character or characters are in the moment, in that moment, what is it like for them, you know, and you can never resort to generalization or, or, or stereotype or anything like that. Uh, you, you can say a fucking thriller here. That's okay. Um, I know, amongst friends. <laughs> right. Um, I, I, I know that you, you don't, you know, write with, with any kind of, you know, ideological agenda and you're tr trying to be true to the material and, um, and to the characters. Th there is this argument that, you know, one of the highest values of fiction is that it teaches us empathy for people who are not us, who are very, potentially very different from, from us. And is, 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 that, is, that a, is that a value? I mean, is that a mission? Is, is that something, you know, that, that students should be taught, you know, that, that, this is, that this is something truly valuable that fiction can do? I don't know. I, well, I think it should be, it should always, be, it should never be a dead letter. It should always be an open subject that is openly discussed and without fear and without coercion. You know, the last thing I want, you know, last, I, mean, I live in mortal terror of somebody reading through any of my books and feeling like they've been coerced in any way because that is, that's inhumane. Um, and so you can go through, the, go through the books and you can, you, you know, I trust you, I hope you trust me, and it, it, my books are not for everybody, and, the, and you know. But, but in terms of the way I think of what a novel is or how novels work and what they do, partially is that you, you can't write them according to theory. They just fall apart. They turn into propaganda or sermons or something like that. Um, and I, because I think that, and again, this is just, you know, if so anecdotal, it's just so subjective. But one of the things I've just found with my own writing is that, you know, one of the ways it predictably and inevitably goes bad is when I find my motive for pursue, you know, pursuing a passage, a chapter, an entire novel, or whatever. It, it always goes bad if I find myself trying to explain something. Because if you're really writing about these kind of irreducible human, the kind of irreducible mystery of what it is to be a human being, at a certain point, hopefully very quickly, hopefully before the novel even begins, you've, I feel, I, I think of it as you've crossed a threshold beyond which any Im bringing any in impulse to explain what you find beyond that threshold will inevitably, whether you m intend it or not, will be to explain something away. Um, and so I just think a lot about just description. It's description of lived experience. What is it like? And what is it like in this moment? What is it like for you? What is it like for you? And it is it's that old, it's that old kind of idea of I and thou, which is that sort of what I find kind of elegant and beautiful idea that, you know, that you, it's almost Zen-like or something, but you, you embody your own humanity um, in direct proportion to how much you devote it to bearing witness to the humanity of somebody else. You know, you embody yourself by being selfless and, devo and devoting your, the best of your intention, uh, atten the best of your attention and um, respect and all that sort of stuff to other people's lived experience. Some, some of the inhabitants of Malaga Island, um, the historical basis for this, uh, were judged to be feeble-minded by the state. Uh, and many were believed to be the products of incest, um, as are many of your, your characters. Um, some folks, with regard to the, uh, the historical injustice of displacing people from the island, have taken feeble-mindedness as a kind of slander um, and the accusations of incest as a kind of slander. Mm -hmm. uh, th there's, a, there's a sense among some people that those allegations uh, dehumanize the community when, when of course they don't. Their, their humanity would have as much validity as anyone else's were, were those allegations to, to be true. C can, you, can you talk about that? Yeah, so one, th one thing about the way that the book, the way that I wrote the novel um, that's relevant to this is when I, you know, I was, 
I, I was just reading about various communities in the United States that were racially integrated, you know, mostly right after the Civil War. I just ended up being interested in that because uh, I was reading about labor unions, the history of labor unions. And, you know, like labor unions were some of the first institutions in the country that were really very actively, you know, fought for civil rights and women's suffrage and all this kind of stuff. Um, but so the moment I, re I read an art, the, the main source, uh, you know, for the, for the novel, uh, the, main source of inspiration for the novel was a single article in Down East magazine from like 1980 that was about Malcolm Hill. All of these, we were talking a little bit at dinner about ev evocative photographs, old photographs that you just wonder, who were you? What were you thinking? What were the circumstances? So one of the things is that the, the kind of the minute I realized that this set of circumstances, particularly on the island, particularly on Maine, because my, my mother's family is from Maine, I've written about Maine before, but the moment that I knew that, like, that, that I was going to be haunted by just the idea of a racially integrated community that is evicted from the, where it's been for over a century, I stopped doing any research on Malaga Island because I didn't have any organic connection. I was just a writer whose you know, imagination, like literally, like it just like, it's just set on fire. Um, and I, so I wanted to write it because there were many communities that were like this. There were many communities that suffered this kind of similar fate. So it was, it was local history, it was New England history, it was American history, and then I just kept thinking, it's Eden. It's like, you know, displacement and injustice and this sort of thing. Um, and I, I didn't want to write about historical characters. I didn't want to find out about, you know, because I don't know anything about the, I have no connection to the families that were up there, that sort of thing. So in the course of then, and I also wanted to give myself the kind of the imagine, like my, my imagination, I wanted to give my imagination the latitude to be able to run the idea of a set of characters that were suffering this kind of plot, these circumstances. I wanted to be able to refract them through um, things like the Old Testament. Um, Shakespeare, because I teach these things and they are, you know, I think of literary fiction as fiction that is inspired by and in conversation with other literature. And one of the kind of, you know, predominant themes in the Old Testament is that Israel, as a you know, nation, is a vanishingly small and utterly vulnerable population of people that's sort of running around in between, you know, these huge empires, and that one of the most pressing existential um, threats is just actual extinction. Um, and it, at certain nodal points in the plot of the Old Testament, you know, going to the anthology of the writings, um, the, it, it, Israel is, is, is so close to um, actual extinction that um, that people resort to incest, like Lot and and his daughters, and there are and it's it, it, they are, um, uh, Judah and Tamar, and so this idea, uh, you know, I had the idea that oh my gosh, that island! If you have an island with all these people and they're from different cultures and they are you know they're one family, it's like Noah's Ark. Um, but what if you're on Noah's Ark but you couldn't get off? and that, that humanity would start involuting rather than elaborating. And so that's where that, you know, so I was thinking, oh, incest, the way it's used in the Bible, and this kind of poetic, this kind of poetic literary use of it. But then one of the things I found since publication, like, be careful, <laughs> here we go, you know, I mean, I, I knew that when it came into the world, there would be things that I just hadn't been aware of. You can't be, and part of it is just being, saying, I stand by every word in the book, and if somebody calls me to the carpet, I'm, I'm here, here I am, and I will engage, I mean, this is what art does, and this is what democracy and civilization should be about, having these conversations. One of the things that I didn't know, but found out about was that that there was no incest on the historical Malaga Island. It was just a slur. It was a rumor. It was a way that you know that these people were slandered and libeled, um, and and, uh, and and some people took exception to it. And it's do you know uh, that's I, that that's just part of sometimes what happens is you have these real misunderstandings, and people have to decide whether what. You know, Everybody has to decide whether everybody's trying to figure these, have dialogue about these things in good faith or not, you know. Um, 
But it does seem at least consistent with the fact that the way that the people were treated in all these sorts of communities, that that would be one of the things that they would be accused of, you know, and that would be one of the things that would be, um, you know, the, the occasion of incest would be considered one that was a legitimate way of, you know, um, um, uh, um, reducing those people, those populations, to b below the threshold, below the threshold of b being human and being like animals or something that's subhuman. And this is all in, you know, the when in, when the people uh, were. Um, Evicted from Malaga Island, I think it was like the same month, July, I think it's July of 1912, there was the first International Congress for Eugenics taking place in London. And so all of the, so I, in my fictional Apple Island, there are occasions of, one of them is a case of, you know, sexual violence, uh, you know, brought upon a woman. And, you know, that's the kind of thing where if I'm not just thinking about Malaga, I was thinking of places like Pitcairn, Pitcairn. Island, you know, where this is actually has been historically a not uncommon problem in, in, in those communities. And so, um, yeah, I mean, so again, you see, how it's all, all just sort of, you know, is, is kind of um, coextensive in a way. So I'm going to ask one uh, last question and then I'll open it up to the audience. I, I did. Uh, are, yeah, there are people in the balcony. It's hard for me to see the balcony, I, 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 or the balconies. I, I did promise uh, students and anyone in the afternoon session that I w if they were in the balconies and they had a question, I would call them. But I don't. I'm not going to see you unless you like wave frantically at me. Um, I have to shield my eyes. Um, but I, I, I'd like to ask. Uh, I'd like to ask about eugenics. So you, you, this is a time when, when eugenics becomes all the rage. Um, you know, there, there's the sense that uh, certain races are, are better than other races, and, and certain people are born with better or worse uh, genes than others, and that, that breeding genetics uh, determine a person's ranking in the human hierarchy. Uh, terrifyingly, that perspective seems to be coming back into fashion. Uh, the idea that certain lives have less legitimacy than other lives. Um, for example, we have politicians talking about immigrants poisoning the blood of our country. Um, and again, you don't describe yourself as an activist artist, um, but w what's the place of, a, of an urgent social issue like, like this um, in your novel or? Well, I think as a novelist, you know, I, I, the way I often put it to my writing students is why bother putting less than everything at stake when you're making a work of art? Why write about something that you can get to the bottom of you know that sort of thing, um, and so I just think that these things are urgent. I think they're perennial. I think that's another one of these. Th th the more I look into history or whatever for myself, again, the more I find. And that's the other thing is that you know, novel writing, fiction is sort of speculative. So you don't, you're not making an argument that people have to agree with. Or, you know, you can, you can, you can, you can have different characters, for example, on a, in a very, you know, ha have very passionate and opposite viewpoints of things, and you can l l dramatize this, you know, the, the way that these things interact, and, and, it, and it can be meaningful. So, I mean, I think eugenics is not, um, I mean, it's, 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 it's sort of coming back in one of its cruder forms, but I don't think it's ever gone away for a second, you know. Um, and I think that what it is, is, and, you know, one of the things I was interested in with, with, with eugenics and the way that it's used in the, in the book is just, it's, it's just the same old stark, blank bigotry that shows back up kind of wreathed in the would-be imprimatur of science. And of course, science is science. You can't, you can't deny it. It's just fact, you know, that's the, that's the kind of rhetoric around it. Um, and so this idea that that it comes back in this sort of attenuated or sort of supposedly sophisticated and irrefutable uh, form, and that that has some authority, um, where you know that that again just encourages people to to dehumanize one another. And I think part of it is just that idea that that. Um, 
you know, according to the color of your skin or the genes or whatever. I even, you know, like two years ago, I re subscribed to Science Magazine, and there was, you know, this study that said, oh, it turns out that there's not a gay gene. There's a suite of genes. And I was just like, what, what an improvement. Yeah, wow. So much more sophisticated. Like, you've begun with your conclusions and you just find them in more and more elaborate or less elaborate ways. But um, the idea, I mean, and, and so again, this is just like the novel becomes an occasion to be thinking about, like, you, you cannot, you can't quantify the value of a human being. And that's where, what, what is like the cult of the algorithm other than just like the idea that you can, if you can't quantify it, it has no value, that sort of thing. Just thinking about the difference between qualitative value, the status of being human is a qualitative status. It's not, it's not you can't quantify it, um, but we continually do, <laughs> you know, do it. And I mean, that's one of the things in the Bible, is sort of like the, one of the greatest sins is, you know, is, is, is demeaning someone else else's humanity in order to confirm your own and part of the reason why it's so subject to so much threat and fire and brimstone is that there's nothing easier to do than confirm yourself you know those ignorant people in the midwest who are all republicans it's their fault you know, instead of like what's well, your fault too I mean, you know, that idea that, you know, like we all have our bigotries and we all have our prejudices and you have to really be, you can never take it for granted that you don't have them. You always have to kind of keep it live and be thoughtful and, and what was the question? Sorry. Yeah. I mean, that's what I like to do is, you know, the novel is, is capacious enough so that you can really get, you can really get lost in these sorts of things for years and then watch a particular iteration of, you know, and consideration and description of those kinds of things, you know, take shape and take form. Um, yeah. So we'll be taking questions from the audience. Uh, Jen is in the back with a microphone and the microphone will not make its way to the balconies. So if you do have a question in the balconies, um, you can wave your hands around and you can shout. Um, and we, we would love to hear any question that you might have. So. And when I was in a band, you know what we'd say? We'd say, how are you all doing up in the balcony? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, is there a so question on this level first? Yeah, 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 we, 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 okay, we, we, we can start, start on this level, yeah. Thank God. Here you go. Thanks a lot. Um, hi, um, very nice to meet you, I'm Carl. So, um, and I know Paul and, and all of you guys, and, they're, and I love this uh, Writers Institute. Loved your book. Um, can you talk a little bit about Bridget and her relationship with Ethan? And what I mean by that is the notion of the of sameness and otherness. Like Bridget regarded Ethan as her kin, like her um, sameness. She there's one passage, beautiful passage, where you talk about where she heard Ethan singing, and she was singing a beautiful Irish lullaby. And it's like oh, you know, he's Irish like me. And, and then she finds the photographs. And then suddenly, Ethan's no longer the sameness. She, he becomes other. And she gets so, and you write that so beautifully, she becomes so unbelievably upset about this that she ends up like cutting herself and like, you know, and, and, and bleeding all over the place and trying to bring Mr. Hale his, his bread and butter and in and, and the kitchen's a mess and it just becomes the sense of the chaos. So, you know, just the way you, you know, just depicted the, you know, we're kin, we're same, and then suddenly it flips on a dime like nowhere other because she finds these photos of people who don't look like them. So I just wonder if you can talk about that. Yeah, I think with, with that, so the, the two characters to whom he's referring are um, to, to, uh, two young kids. Uh, I thought of them like Romeo and Juliet. You know, they're 15 years old and they have this romance and they fall in love. And, and then, and then the, the sort of um, her discovering that, you know, so, the, so the, the, the boy with whom she falls in love is named Ethan Honey. He's the kid that's going away that they're all having the banquet for. And he he, uh, more than any other islander, um, presents as white. He has fair hair and blonde, blonde hair, what, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes, whatever. Um, and I think, f f for me, the way that that ended up being, you know, that r that romance, and that it's strange because that's a whole. It's just a whole section of the book that just leaves the island and just depicts this star-crossed love affair. And I realized after the book was published that that was the other Eden. 
actually that's because the, they actually have this kind of innocent love affair. That, um, and, and some background on Bridget for folks who haven't read. She's Irish and she's an immigrant and she is coming. She's a she's a like a housekeeper, a maid in this large um, uh, um, at this large estate. Um, that uh, Ethan has been brought to so that he can, nominally he's going to learn how to paint and go to art school eventually. Um, and she herself is from an island off the southwestern coast of um, Ireland, um, off the Dingle Peninsula. It's called Grand Blasket Island. It was a similarly kind of isolated place that I think in the 50s, um, uh, everybody was uh, removed from that island and brought because actually it turned out that it was they couldn't communicate with the island during the winter and it was so nobody knew what, the, what their fates were um, and just as an interesting historical side note uh, a lot of those families from Dingle ended up and their um, descendants live in Springfield Massachusetts it's kind of interesting um, and so I, I, again that was the sort of thing where I realized oh they're from they're, they're from these islands and they know some of the same Irish folk songs, little lullabies and this and that. And so it became just the two people who become implicated in one another, whose hearts and souls become implicated together. And then something that, in this case, it was, you know, race. It was, you know, the, his background, his, you know, the, the, the community he came from. But it's also that kind of universal human shock and how do you almost, you know, can't recover from it when you find out the, that your beloved is not who you, the person with whom you fell in love, that sort of thing. In this case, it was right. And one of the, so this is an interesting thing where um, kind of sort of to do with what we've been talking about is I originally had her, um, she hanged herself in the original in the original version and, and partly it was because i wrote this very operatic set piece where you know these people who are mowing the hay in this in the meadow at this estate they dramatically open the barn door and there she is hanging it's like oh look, i can see the opera already you know and i was sort of like you know you know sort of stunned by that um and then uh, but then that would have meant that she couldn't she couldn't get over that, right? You know, and then my, when my wife, my wife won't read any of my, she's just like, whatever, she, let me, I'll read it when you're finished. Take a look, take a look. And one of the things that she said about the book when she first read it, is she just said, that girl is way too smart and they love each other. She would never kill herself. She's got too many intellectual and emotional resources. She said, take it out. And I said, okay. <laughs> In that case, I was like, okay. You know, it's a, like, it went from like this big, amazing, operatic, you know, melodramatic drama to like her like burning the toast at the end of that section. It was one of those weird, weird sorts of things. And, but then one of the things that I realized is that it, you know, that was one of those things where my wife just took the whole thing and just showed it to me from another point of view. Just a slight one degree difference. I was like, not only does she not hang herself, but she, she's going to go to the island. She loves him. She's you know, so after that initial shock, she, re, you know, and again, it's not, I don't beat the drum. I don't say, so therefore, you know, don't, you know. It's one of those things about you know, um, making points or making arguments, like don't be bigoted, don't judge people. It's just sort of like when you said, uh, you know, it's like nothing could be more obvious and nothing, you know, it's like no shit. But you know, what's interesting is that we all know better and we don't act better necessarily. But she does, she, she, and again, it was just this quiet little thing where she just, just depicting her as persisting at, you know, she just you know, puts her hat on and takes her back and just tries to find him. It speaks for itself, you know, the fact that she's just like, I love him. So there's some kind of, you know, there's something sort of, wonder, to me, kind of quietly humane and humanizing and steadfast and transcendent. She transcends that initial thing that would sort of, possi very possibly sort of, um, be, t be tied into kind of bigotry or familiar prejudices that she would have inherited, you know. So, yeah. Mr. Harding, thank you for uh, your talk tonight. Uh, my name is Mike. One of the, so uh, again, what led me to the book was kind of like a, a year long journey that started with a Google search. Uh, love going to Maine every year. Me and my spouse, we would travel there the summers. And one day I just kind of found myself Googling, like, why is Maine so white? You know? And it was interesting to, uh, to see that because I was like, oh, let me look at the history and, and some of these things. 
So uh, again, I, I do want to just really uh, say that some of the imagery in, in your book, especially the scene with um, uh, the, the, I'm drawing a blank with the, the young girl um, and Ethan Honey. Uh, where Bridget. Basic, Bridget, thank yeah. you. Where they start to uh, mix kind of their blood onto like a painting and things like that. And the fact that you um, kind of put somebody who is uh, black and then somebody who is Irish together, considering the history there, um, going back um, <clears throat> hundreds of years, it's, it, it, was, it was beautiful to see that. Um, the, the question that I have, um, because the, the character of Mr. Diamond um, r really brought up a lot of stuff uh, related to um, just the, the the history and the concept of like white saviorism, but packaged in you know the the bow of religion. I, I wonder. Uh, my question for you is: In your research, were you interested in things like you know people like Rene Bach, who had like started the one of the missionaries that went to um, Uganda to start an orphanage, and what, what were some of the things that um, really inspired you to really uh, highlight that part of your story, which was, hey, this this concept of just what I what I make up was like white saviorism, but packaged up in religion. Yeah, I think it's one of those things, like the way that I try to compose is that I knew from that article I read about Malaga that there was a kind of missionary slash school teacher there. Um, and um, so it wasn't, I, I didn't have an idea of like, you know, white savior, white messiah. It's, it's one of those things where it's just like, you don't need to think it up first. If just wait, it'll arrive in some form or another rather than sort of induce it on the character and from the very beginning my the, the attitude I had about how that character was going to work was based on what the, the character I think of as the as the protagonist the main kind of the main main character which is the woman Esther honey she's kind of the matriarch of this community um, and just the I there was a photo, very you know evocative photograph in the in the um, article I'd read about Malaga Island of a woman who looked like she was probably in her 70s or 80s and she had what looked like two of her grandchildren on her lap she's in a rocking chair and I just imagined you know first of all I thought as I sat I said what are you thinking what is going on here what's that and then I realized wait this Photograph was probably taken in 1910 1908 maybe earlier and so like there were no little cameras then like Somebody didn't just come to the island and take a snapshot of her. And so I was like, what would the motive be for photographing this woman with her? And the woman has a different skin complexion than the daughter, you know, the granddaughters or whoever they were. And, and so then I just thought of people, interlopers, this sort of thing. And, I, and, and you know, again, you know, just like, who are you? What's happening? And one of the things I just did with that image was... Fictionally, I walked a from, from behind the camera, from behind the person who was taking the photograph, I walked around to where she was, and I got behind her, and I saw you know, the, the guy taking the pictures, and I saw the people who had come to you know, sort of do their pseudo-anthropology, their eugenics, all this stuff on her. And, you know, just after, you know, again, so just spending long time just sort of thinking of elaborating to myself, like, un, like it was like a crystal or something just unfolding until finally I just said, you know, after one day, you know, thinking about this, you know, what do you think about all this? And she basically said, I'm going to swear again, but she, you know, what, what do you think of, what are you thinking right now? And the answer was basically like, get the fuck off my island. Get out of my home. This, you're, you're trespassing. And so I just had that sense that she, a lot of the book has to do with prophecy because I, the Old Testament, I am going to answer your question, I promise. Um, but a lot of the, you know, I think about prophecy, and prophecy in the Old Testament is not some miraculous, supernatural ability to tell the future, to see the future. It's actually, prophets know where it's at. It's about speaking truth to power. It's about looking at things and seeing things clearly. And if you see things clearly, if you see where it's at, there's no mystery where it's going to go. 
you know? And so the sense that, from the very beginning, I had the sense that when she saw Matthew Diamond, this guy who's perfectly well-intended, because he's, he doesn't, he doesn't have like a program, like I'm going to go and save those people. He's, he's, you know, again, his good intentions, he's not very organized, he's not very whatever, you know, but, um, and, and, and she just sees him and just knows this is it. I can see the end, I can see the end, like you've just broken the seal on this community. Um, and, but rather than making him a one-dimensional villain, so part of it is just like, I, I don't want to have a character who's just flat character. You don't want to have somebody that's just a one-dimensional vil villain, because then it makes the whole book vulnerable to possibly reductive readings. Like, there's the bad guy, slap, slap, slap. slap. So, so one of the things I did, I, two things, again, you know, one is from Shakespeare, you know, the, what he does with his villains. And another was from the Swiss theologian Karl Barth, with whom we're all obviously familiar. Um, um, one of the things about Shakespeare that he does is his characters are smart and they know what they're doing, but they still do it. So, for example, Macbeth. He knows, if I kill the king, I'm just going to get on a rocket sled and go straight to hell. And he's right. You know, but it doesn't stop him from killing the king. You know, and so the, even that's so like already you have a more complicated, richer, human, recognizably human character because that's a scalable thing all the way from like, I know I shouldn't smoke the cigarette, you know, to I shouldn't eat that cake, to, you know, I shouldn't leave my brother to die in the ditch. And yet I'm doing, I'm smoking while I'm leaving my brother to die. So there is that. Um, and then, and, and, and so to have him know be completely aware of his bigotry and to completely deplore it at the same time and recognize that it's an absolutely terrible thing, but to feel it nonetheless. That seems to be, you know, a, a, just that, that g more generically, that's a, almost, you know, universal human experience to feel things that you wish you didn't feel and you still feel them. Um, and then I was just thinking about um, you know, Karl Barth, who is you know, this famous like, Swiss Reformed theologian who wrote a t 10 million page church dogmatics. I've read the whole thing. I think it's a masterpiece of human thought and close reading and all these sorts of things. Um, and he was one of the founding members of this uh, thing called the Confessing Church, which was during Hitler's reign. And it was, a, um, it was one of the o only organized institutions that you know, openly tried to defy Hitler during the Holocaust. And so I was like, what an admirable, admirable guy. And after, you know, reading him for 20 years, tens of thousands of pages, I just came across a line in some letter that he wrote in some, you know, it's just saw it in some anthology of, where he's, he's saying that he's glad that his son is not afflicted with the big, he says, I'm glad my son does not have the bigotry that I have, which is the revulsion I feel whenever I'm in the presence of a living Jew. And it was just... You know, and the, what's so disgusting is a living Jew, like a dead Jew, you know. And, and, but here's somebody, here's one of the only people who did anything to try to alleviate the Holocaust it, 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 from the inferno of it. And so that's just like, you can't, you just got to live with that. Both of those things are true, that bigotry, that anti-Semitism, and the fact that he's one of the only people that tried to help, you know. You can't simplify that. That's irreducible. And that's what I'm always looking for as a novelist, is things that, you know, I live in, just for selfish reasons, I live in stark terror of somebody fin reading one of my books once and saying, I get it. I, okay, I get the point. Because if they do that, they never have to think about my book again. As opposed to if I put these complicated, so, you know, take the time to kind of find the way to build these characters. And so that's, but then inevitably, because it's a you know it's a description you know then you get you from that you can you can recognize aspe very familiar aspects of white saviors and the white messiah you know that sort of thing he's being paternalistic you know all, all that kind of stuff but he kind of knows it but he can't stop you know and it's and that's where that's one of those things where it's like that's one of those points where I just let that be complicated and the most degrading and terrible thing you could do to the reader would be to tell them what to make of that. You trust the reader, and you just put these complicated things, and just say, "I don't know. I don't know exactly what I think. I can't say anything conclusive about this either, because it's something like real life, which is can't, you can never make a dead letter. You know, <laughs> making dead letters of important things is how you end up dehumanizing other people. For example, you know." I think we have time for maybe one more question, and, and if you don't 
if you didn't get to ask a question, um, you will have the opportunity to do that outside uh, on the side. We're in the Futterer Lounge, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll be outside this uh, space um, and you, you can uh, post question, um, chat with Paul Harding. Um, so, final question, yeah. Hi, good evening, Paul. My name is Jim. Great having you here. Um, where did you come up or find the original story of the island? Or I know you seem to have proximity of there, Maine and Massachusetts, but where did you find out about the original colony of the island? So what, what happened is, as I was sort of kind of vaguely alluding to earlier, is that I was reading a history of organized labor in the United States after the Civil War. Um, uh, and... Um, like I said, a lot of these, a number of you know early unions were some of the first, you know, in, formal institutions in the United States that advocated for things like civil rights. Because when you have large working class communities, they tend to be just naturally the kind of the more mo historically whatever, whether inevitably or whatever, but um, uh, racially mixed or culturally mixed um, <coughs> communities and so you have to figure you have to figure out how everybody can get along peaceably and relatively equitably and that sort of thing um, like the, the big example is it would be uh, the port of Oakland California you know like after World War one you have these huge communities that you know so there was lots of civil rights activism going on there and the women's suffrage and all this sort of stuff and um, and so they were trying you know that just the idea of trying to counteract and contradict that kind of racism um, uh, and, and all those sorts of things. And I, so then I thought, well, you know, and I've been reading also a book, the great um, book called The Color of Law that's all about, um, like, the, you know, the U United States court system, particularly the Supreme Court, you know, saying that we have nothing to do with segregation or integration or anything, and yet they do. They've got plenty to do with it. Um, but the idea that, um, like, what is the fate of integration Integrated, racially integrated communities generally in the United States it's not tends to be pretty bad. Um, and so I just thought, let's see, you know, there must have been all black communities in the United States after the Civil War, and there must have been racially integrated communities, because I feel like segregation and integration, they're both like kind of socially engineered situations, and I have this sense, it, you know, not utopian, not naive or romantic, but just like if you kind of leave people alone, people who are not on the make and trying to, you know, profit at other people's expenses, people tend to get together, you know, again, not like kumbaya or whatever, but people lay claim to one another, you know, they're, they're, people be, are interested in one another, they fall in love with one another, they intellectually engage one another, whatever. So I was just interested in kind of just, just getting a survey of just like kind of what was going on in the United States with sort of, you know, integrated communities. So it was just, it literally, I went to Google and I just said integrated community, racially integrated communities in the United States after the Civil War. It was just that stupid. Um, and just, you know, just page after page after page of all these places just started coming up, you know? And I was like, duh, of course. You know what I mean? It was one of those things that's just like, you know, you feel so, like, whatever after you think, like, of course that's the case. I just never thought about it. Um, and Malaga Island, the circumstances of Malaga Island came up, you know, pretty quickly, you know, within a couple of pages. And it just started to, from there, it just started to tick boxes that worked personally for me because my, my, um, my, uh, my mother's family is from, uh, her parents are from Maine, they were Dover, Fox, Foxcroft, and Garland, Maine. Um, and I had written about that, you know, in Tinker's, my first novel, it was set in Maine. So I thought, oh, a community in Maine, you know. Um, and then one of the families that was evicted was um, sent, was, was committed to a place called the Maine School for the Feeble Minded. You can imagine the joys that await. Um, and um, um, that had served as a model for an institution. It actually didn't serve as a model. It, for, it, in Tinker's, in my first novel, one of the characters has epilepsy, and um, he leaves that family, abandons that family when he finds out about his wife's um, intentions of having him committed to the main school for the feeble-minded. I changed the name of the institution, but it was that. And that actually was part my, like my actual history in my family, is that my great great grandmother was going to have my great grandfather sent to main school and he got wind of it and he absconded he you know um 
Uh, and so I thought, oh, Maine. And then it's on an island, and I don't know any of the writers in the house. Island, to me, islands are catnip as a writer. You know, and I immediately started thinking, ooh, it's kind of like the Tempest. Ooh, it's kind of like the Pequod in Moby Dick. It's, you know, it's like a ship almost. It's like Noah's Ark, you know, but they couldn't get off. So it's their sanctuary until it becomes their prison. You know, and I just immediately was just like, ooh, ooh. And then I found out that like to so the month these, this was all happening, the first International Congress for Eugenics was happening in London, presided over by Darwin's son, one of Charles Darwin's sons. I was just like, you know, when you're a writer, it's like you've you're got the dowsing, where you're like, you, give me a sign, and those things, it was just like, you know, you know joker, joker, joker. I was, I was just, and, I, and I was just, I literally, and this is another one of those things about like who, who, who can write what story or whatever, you know, from the most personal, subjective kind of, you know, point of view, it's, all, it's, it's involuntary. Like, I, that was it. Like, I couldn't stop thinking about that. Those, I was already thinking about the characters, and I was thinking about, oh my gosh, if, if they can't get off the island, they start involuting rather than elaborating across the world, they actually start. So that's the incest, and just, it, 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 it just started just building up, and I had been writing some other stuff. And I just started saying, oh my gosh, that character who I don't know why he's out in the meadow painting, you know, in this little bit of stuff that I have from my second book that didn't make it, you know, I, I was like, he's, he's from that island. And how did he get, and so how did he, so a lot of the story is going to be me figuring out how he got from that island to painting in the meadow of my fictional village, Enon. So a lot of it is just... It's found, it's imp improvised, you stumble on it. And I very much set up my, the way I write novels to be, you know, to be not happy accidents always, this is very somber stuff, but, but profound, poignant, meaningful, engaging accidents. Uh, because part of what works with me is I always am trying to find ways to let the, let the characters and the circumstances elaborate themselves in a way where the, if it works, the novel will be a million times better than anything I could have thought up for it. I always assume the novel is smarter than I am, it's more brilliant than I am, it's more humane, it's funnier, it's deeper, it's more generous, it's more profound than anything that I could sort of intellectually think up and then deploy. You know, um, and so just lots of listening and lots of and just working with language and just thinking about w w what every one of these different elements suggests and then l letting it elaborate, you know.